Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to this session on human decision making. Almost all individuals are involved in some kind of decision making process, be it a common man, uh, be it an operator on a system or anything like driving, flying a plane or even housewives take decision in the kitchen. So decision making is a very important activity and understanding what goes into decision making can be very useful for our understanding of the ergonomic processes. Just to recapitulate what we have already done, working memory and long-term memory contribute to human performance. We'll see that working memory again plays a very important role in decision making, attention also. And uh, normally the resources that are allocated to decision making can be important. Then information encoding, duration of information retention in the memory storage capacity of each memory process and retrieval processes are specific to the particular memory. For example, working memory is short-lived, the code is generally phonetic, can be visual, and also uh, the, the transfer of information takes place from short working memory to long-term memory. Then the loss of information from memory they can be passive decay, but mostly it is understood in terms of some interference processes, where new information or old information interferes with the current information, and therefore memory can be affected. It can be affected positively or negatively. So the, there can be a facilitatory effect or an interference effect uh, based on that. So we can say that there's an interaction between the information that is acquired earlier, that interferes with the present information, and also information that is acquired in the future interacts with the information acquired now. The memory plays an important role in situation awareness. Situation awareness is very critical in uh, most places because unless an individual is aware of the situation, then decision processes will not be possible. So we'll see again situation awareness is critical. Now after today's session, uh, you should be able to describe the key factors that influence decision making. So decision making processes are affected by various outside factors. There are internal information processing components that we have talked about in the information processing model. These components are involved and their processes, their limitations or whatever affects them will also affect decision making. In addition to that, there are some external factors which influence decision making process. And this can be in terms of uh, delay in decision making, in terms of errors committed in decision making, uh, taking wrong decisions, for example, wrong, quote unquote, wrong in a given situation, etc. Then uh, a distinction is possible between rational and irrational decision making. And why should people make irrational decisions? Because in most systems, on most systems, Individuals should take rational decisions. Rationality assumes that information about all possible alternatives in terms of the probability with which these alternatives can occur and the consequences of an action taken on the basis of those alternative situations, they are known. Is that the case? If that is not the case, then sometimes, in fact, in, on many occasions, individuals resort to irrational decision making. Then uh, you should be able to list the characteristics of optimal decision making. So what is optimal decision making and when does it take place? And also describe three approaches to decision making. And we'll see how these approaches can be used to determine, uh, say, enhancing decision making in different situations. So what is decision making? It is the cognitive process of choosing. So there's a choice involved. 
So that means if uh, there is no choice, there is no decision making. So suppose there is only one alternative, there is no choice. So decision making is not involved, it's a very simple situation, but that will happen very rarely. Uh, most situations are such that there will be choices. The cognitive process of choosing between two or more alternatives, ranging from the relatively clear cut, so these alternatives can be clear cut. For example, uh, if we want to eat at a restaurant, then we know exactly what is available there and we know what will be satisfaction, our satisfaction or utility of whatever food we order, etc. So there is a clear cut situation, we know about the alternative, we know what action we are taking, we know the consequences, satisfaction or utility uh, satisfaction. To the complex, for example, selecting a mate, this is a very complex process. In fact, the processes may be classified into routine decisions and elaborate decisions. So complex decisions will require elaboration. That means we have to think a lot about the alternatives, evaluate those alternatives and come out with the result. What will be the result and uh, will that be according to our requirement, what we really need to do. So normally human tendency is to automate things so as fast as they can routinize the processes. For example, if I am asked to arrange a party, let's say for 100 people, then I am not a good decision maker for that because I have very little experience in doing that. So I will start thinking afresh. This will become a complex decision making for me. But for a caterer or a restaurateur, uh, this is a, a very easy process because uh, they have been doing it. They are experienced in it. So for them, it will be a routine problem. So it depends on individuals, whether a particular problem for in which about which a decision has to be taken is being faced by a novice or an expert. So expert or novice, that can make a distinction. As you know, there's just uh, one variable and there'll be other variable and other influences that'll be there on decision making and we'll look into those. So just to recapitulate our information processing model and to locate where exactly decision making processes are located in that information processing model, uh, let's revisit the information processing model. So in the first place, uh, there's a sensory input. So assumption is there are alternatives available in the external environment. The environment presents, say, certain stimuli, events, or some actions by other people, or uh, maybe uh, there's some information on the display. So these, this type of information is available in the external environment, and so there is a sensory input to begin with. When the decision process starts, there is a sensory input. These alternatives must exist out there. Now, these may be hazy or uncertain. They may be the cues. Uh, we had defined cues as some weak stimuli, uh, which are not necessarily the basic stimuli on which some action is to be taken, but they help support. They support the stimulus processing. So this may be hazy or uncertain. So at the first level, in the sensory input, there, there is some information available from the external environment which may, about which we may not be certain. We may be certain, but uh, most often there will be an uncertain situation. And then the decision making comes under the internal, mental, or cognitive processes stage. So working memory and long-term memory both contribute to it. Long-term memory is in the form of expertise. For example, I gave the example of a caterer. And working memory is in the case of the novices. Novices don't have anything in their long-term memory, so they cannot bank upon their experience. So decision making involves diagnosis, a diagnosis of the situation. For example, a surgeon is involved in the diagnostic process. A medical diagnosis is involved. So how is the diagnosis carried out? Is there some set procedure to carry out diagnostics? Or do uh, individuals or experts in different domains use different diagnostic processes? We'll see there is some there are some principles uh, which can be applied to all fields and all areas. Then on the basis of that, an action is finally selected. And when the action is implemented, it leads to certain consequences. These consequences then come back as a feedback. In the external environment, some changes are made by the action, by those activities. And then this comes out 
from the action taken to and the input part again as a feedback. Again, feedback uh, generally will also be uncertain. You know, feedback is not necessarily well defined. It may be delayed, for example, and if the feedback is delayed or undefined, then the continuous decision making process will be affected. In most situations, there will be a continuous decision making process, for example, in driving or flying a plane. Where there is a need to continuously process information and continuously take decisions, change decisions depending upon the changing environment because situation may change and situation awareness will influence the individual's responses accordingly. So this is just to present a simple view or representation of principal stages and decision making. So decision making involves certain stages and uh, so hazy and uncertain cues are available where the role of attention, resources and effort become important. So attention must be paid, attention to be paid to which cues which are more important, which is the more important stimulus, which information is more important and resources will have to be allocated to different alternatives, then effort will be required. More the involvement of the resources, greater the resources, more effort will be required and that can lead to certain consequences. Uh, for example, there will be fatigue because of that over a period of time. Then uh, attention, res resources and effort, they also influence transfer of information from the sensory processes to the decision making stage where selective attention becomes very important. Select specific uh, information that is relevant to the particular problem at hand, diagnosis and then uh, diagnosis involves some kind of hypothesis testing which means that on the basis of the data or information that is available from the environment, the operator or the decision maker forms certain initial hunches and if this information is strengthened by other cues for example, then this goes to the level of hypothesis. Hypothesis is a kind of belief, a belief statement that uh, there is a red light and or uh, that there is a signal to turn right when we are driving and so on. So hypothesis is a belief, some kind of belief that an individual may forms on the basis of the available information. And this belief does not get established in the first instance. For example, a medical diagnosis would involve you know various kinds of inputs from the patient and then the doctor or medical professional will take a decision and if a decision cannot be reached because alternative hypothesis would be there, which one to select, then the more some tests may be done uh, and uh, on the basis of the results of those tests, then there is more evidence in support of some set or one particular hypothesis and then finally diagnosis is complete. Uh, it may complete in the sense that on the basis of whatever information is available. And then response selection is based on the probability of different outcomes. So when a particular action is taken, what is the probability of particular outcomes? So probabilities also become important uh, where value, cost and risk have to be considered in taking decision. Then the influences on decision making, uncertain, I have talked about it, about the external world. We know what is uncertainty, we have defined it in the information theory in that session. So if there are different alternatives and they, uh, they, they have equal or uh, different probabilities, different probabilities pose, that situation poses a more complex situation and so on. So simple, uh, you know, will it rain? This is a simple situation where if you are going out of your house, you can take a decision whether to carry an umbrella or a raincoat with you or not to carry an umbrella or a raincoat. Then conflict regarding one's preference. Uh, should I go for higher studies? or take up a job, you know, there is a conflict and conflicts can be resolved, again a decision making is required. We will not go into conflict resolution because that is an area in itself, but this is also a variable that influences decision making. Time, time pressure for example, how much time am I allowed to take a decision or is possible to be used for taking a decision. Automation bias, uh, you know, it is, it happens that most often we may bank on automation 
and for example, in uh, the, the pilots may bank on automation. Uh, they may run the aeroplane on autopilot, for example, at times. Now, when it is, uh, say, the weather is not friendly, if there's a possibility of some weather which is unfriendly, then you know the, the, the pilot is involved in a kind of a decision where to whether to run on autopilot or to run the plane manually. A GPS, traffic alert, and autopilot are these some examples of automation bias. And individuals have this tendency to be biased toward automation. Familiarity and expertise uh, with the situation, um, the caterer, for example, and fatigue, and then framing. So we look at uh, some of these influences on the decision-making process. So these stages can be broadly divided into front-end stages, back-end decision-making, and finally the evaluation. So front-end stages involve cues from the environment, selective attention, diagnosis, and back-end decision-making involves choice of an action, and finally evaluating the consequence of the action. It's always important that the consequences are evaluated because that will uh, provide a good experience and expertise for future. If an individual is going to be involved in similar kinds of situations at various occasions, then it's always a good idea to learn from the experiences that have taken place right now on the basis of certain decision. How did the decision work? It is not necessary that the same decision will work everywhere. The choice of the same alternative will work everywhere. But then over a period of time, there may be some accumulation of this kind of knowledge and you know that knowledge will be useful. And then there is metacognition. So metacognition can be considered as knowledge about knowledge. What the decision maker knows about what the decision maker knows. You know, this very interesting meta is that kind of thing. So metacognition means what do I know about the cues, uncertainty in the cues, and do I really know it and can I use it in implementation, you know, and similarly at other stages. Now, uh, let us take this simple, simplest situation. Decision under certainty. When we are certain about consequences, about the outcomes, the probabilities are not involved, and therefore we know exactly what will happen. So farmers, for example, if they are certain about whether it is uh, going to be rainy season and therefore what crop to uh, use, and then you know uh, which particular crop will be useful, etc., those alternatives can be decided. And eating in a restaurant, for example, that was an example also. Then come. So in, uh, when the consequences of alternative, each alternative is known for sure, surely what will be the outcome, then a decision process called compensatory decision process can be used. This is called weight added decision. So here, uh, different alternatives, the consequences are known. Again, they are based on certain kind of uh, their importance and what value they have. So we'll see what this importance and value is. So each alternative has certain value attached to it, and it has certain importance. So attribute are, attributes are features that are associated with each alternative. So for example, if I want to buy a shirt, then it has certain attributes like color and uh, shade or texture or what textile has been used, maybe company, brand, etc. So here, uh, the objective is to maximize utility how to maximize utility and this formula utility is equal to importance multiplied by value importance of a particular attribute and the value of the attribute we take those products for each attribute and then sum for all the attributes so now we can see why it is called weight added so we are assigning a weight to each value in terms of its importance of the alternative uh, attribute and then uh, we are adding all these. So we are assigning weight and adding. So that has certain limitations. Here, you know, the assumption is we know, we have all information about all alternatives. So we know exactly what is the value of each alternative and how important is each alternative. 
Sometimes if importance is not known, then certain probabilities can be used. So, you know, there, is, there are various procedures, right? Right now, we are taking the simple example of that. Each, for each attribute, uh, we know the importance of the attribute. When we take up the example, this will become more clear. So, Simon suggested that in such situations, and generally these situations will be there, present, always. Complete information is not available. The rational model assumes that. So, rather than using complete rationality, the decision maker uses bounded rationality. So, rationality is bounded, but whatever, why? Whatever information is available. So, the assumption is that the VAD provides the best possible <coughs> decision or outcome, assuming there is a rational decision. But since it is not, so on whatever information is available, a decision made is made based on VAD and that is called satisficing. So, satisficing is the immediate best solution that can be found based on whatever information is available. And it is possible as more information comes in, then whatever alternative has been chosen may not be the right alternative. But right now, given this situation, because there is a limitation on the alternatives, information about the alternatives, then that is the best decision that has been taken. So, some kind of optimization of decision based on whatever information is available at a given point of time. That is satisficing. And satisficing is a heuristic decision. So, heuristic is, heuristics are shortcuts uh, and quick decision making. Uh, we will look into some more detail as we proceed. Then there is non-compensatory decision making process. In non-compensatory decision making process, here in the VAD we assume that if some attribute is weak, then an, a strong attribute can compensate for that. That is why we are taking weight at it. But if we assume that compensation is not possible, that is if there is a weak attribute, it is a weak attribute. And therefore, in the decision making process, this attribute should not uh, be considered, should be eliminated. And that is why it is called elimination by aspect. So, aspect is again the attribute uh, that is involved. So, let us take this simple example. Uh, suppose, you know, uh, an individual is involved in buying a laptop. Which laptop will the individual buy? Assume that there are three brands, A, B and C. And uh, these brands have uh, certain attributes, say price, weight, warranty and service. And some ratings are obtained by using different individuals. So, rating in terms of 1 to 5 on a scale of 1 to 5. So, the individual is asked to rate each brand on price. So, if price is low, low price will be considered as high rating. As, you know, so, let us assume that uh, uh, individuals will like to have low price. Again, weight low, high rating. Warranty for more period, high rating. And service length for 3 years, 5 years, etc then high rating. So, the individual assigns these ratings from 1 to 5 and suppose for brand A, we get ratings for price, weight, warranty and services 4, 3, 5 and 3. And then for brand B, similarly and brand C, we obtain these ratings. And then we get importance rating. So, again the individual provides how important is price for example. So, individual may say, oh price is not very important for me, therefore it may be rated as low and rating may be 1. But service, post sales service or after purchase service should be strong. The company should provide good service and therefore, uh, importance for service is 4. So, these, uh, you know, there may be overlaps, you know, there is not necessary that there will be just all importance values will be different. The two attributes may have the same importance rating. Now, let us proceed. So, once this has been obtained, what will VAD do? So, in VAD, we have to compute the utility. So, utility for A at the bottom of this particular uh, uh, table, you can see that utility of A is uh, 4, 4 is the rating attribute rating 
and 1 is the importance. So, multiply it 4 by 1, remember that formula, 3 by 3, and if we do that, we get total utility of brand A to be 35. One can say that they, these are part utilities. Part utility is 4 for price, 9 for weight, 10 for warranty, and 12 for service. Economists generally talk about part or whole utility, and uh, you know, so we want to know the whole utility. Once we know the attributes that are important and that have been rated, we want the whole utility. Similarly, utility can be computed for brand B and brand C. So what we get is utility for A is 35, B 20, and C is 33. So we select whatever is the best. So A has the highest utility. So under VAD, the individual will select brand A. Then there is importance rating. So in the elimination by aspect approach or in that model, we proceed, we first consider the most important attribute because this is a non-compensatory process. So we do not bother about compensation of a weaker attribute by a stronger attribute, but we consider the strongest attribute. And if the things are working well on that attribute, that will be the choice. So now strongest attribute is service here. It has the highest value 4. So at the first level, after the importance rating of 4, we are uh, you know, uh, looking at this 1 in the parenthesis is, is about the order. So at the, in the first stage, first order, we consider service it indicates just that. And service has the highest importance in the force if you consider it. Now, if for each attribute, we set a cutoff. So, suppose the individual has set the cutoff as 4 for price, 4 for weight, 2 for warranty, and 2 for service. These are the cutoffs. Then what we find is that if we take service as the most important attribute, then because the cutoff is 2, okay, uh, so we can say that uh, brand B, the service rating for brand B is below the cutoff. So this brand does not satisfy the cutoff, does not meet our cutoff. So we eliminate this. So this red font uh, for C under service, B under service indicates that we eliminate brand B. And now, there are two brands which are left, 3 and 2. So we go to the next important attribute, because there is a tie. So the next important attribute is weight, which is rating of 3. And here we have a cutoff of 4. So we find that since the cutoff is 4, B is already eliminated. So we do not consider B. We consider only A and C. And we find that A on weight has a cutoff as a value which is less than the cutoff, therefore this brand A is eliminated. So brand C is selected. So finally under EBA, brand C is selected. Now generally, uh, you know, people may not be involved in uh, a great amount of computations and all that. So how do we really infer which rule has been used? We infer on the basis of the final decision that has been made. So we move backward. So on the basis of the decision, we work out which decision rule has been used, and then on the basis of that, we say that most of the people will use VAD, some people will use EBA, etc., etc. And then finally, for given situations, some decision can be made. Decision under uncertainty, the risky situation, or this may be ambiguous situation. In risky situation, several alternatives with their priorities are known. But uh, you know, there is a risk involved because whatever decision we, we take, whatever is the outcome, there is a risk involved. So most often, it is possible that the expected value of the outcome, here we consider mostly expected value, expected value of the outcome will be same for different alternatives. Therefore, how do we decide between the alternatives here? Here we estimate the risk by computing standard deviation for each alternate. And by computing that standard deviation, the one which has the least variance, standard deviation is a measure of the variance. Therefore, 
that alternative which shows the least variance that will be selected. So, expected value will not work. What will work is the risk computed on the basis of the variance. Then in an ambiguous situation, precise likelihood of outcome is not known. The individual does not know anything about it. The decision in that situation, the individual can use subjective probability. So, based on earlier experience or some subjective value may be assigned. So, probabilities can be objective, subjective, experimental and so on. But right now, we are talk talking about subjective probabilities. The weight assigned based on what is the likelihood of a particular outcome, that is subjective probability. And decision is based on the expected value of an outcome. So, this subjective probability is used to compute expected value of the outcome. So, let us uh, take how uh, take an example or, or a broad uh, basis to consider what will happen. So, suppose on the basis of the data that is available, for example, in a medical diagnosis, the, the practitioner, the medical practitioner forms certain hypotheses. So, the patient reports certain symptoms and then on the basis of that, the medical professional uh, makes certain hypotheses which are some kind of beliefs. And so, these hypotheses may be HA, HB, there may be more hypotheses to begin with. And then the expert has to decide between these hypotheses. So, state of the world when it is A, suppose it occurs with the probability A. So, these hypotheses are related to the possible states of the world. You know, so, the call uh, signal detectability, there is a possible state of the world and there is our decision. Now, in signal detection theory, we consider just two alternatives, but here there can be several hypotheses, several alternatives. So, we have just uh, taken two to understand what is happening behind the scene. So, state of the world is such that if it is A, it has the probability of occurrence A and state B as the probability of occurrence B. Mind you, these are possible subjective probabilities or based on past experience or whatever. Then the each option if decided has a certain value and so suppose there are two options 1 and 2 and given the state of the world as A or B, suppose the values associated are V1 A, V2 A with state A and V1 B B to B for state B under these two options. So, we now know the values. So, the expected value will be if A is the state of the world and we choose or the individual chooses uh, the first alternative, then the expected value is P A V 1 A. Similarly, for others, these expected values can be computed. So, what will be the choice? What will be the selection? The one with the greatest expected value will be selected. So, suppose P A 1 V 1 A has the highest value in terms of numerical values, then uh, as compared to the other three, then uh, this alternative will be selected and the medical practitioner or expert will come out with the decision uh, there is a possibility. Although, there may be further evidence required in the form of uh, tests, pathological tests and other tests for example. Now, influence of time on decision making. Time also influences decision making. There may be one shot decision or worse is an evolving decision. In one shot decision, uh, just choice of a car okay. and evolving decision, iterative process. So, uh, for example, in medical diagnosis, a medical diagnosis, medication is given, further diagnosis, medication further may be changed or may continue or may be, may be discontinued depending upon further evidence. So, this continues. This is an evolving decision. Decision making evolves over a period of time and so, uh, time may be less or more. Then there is uh, the decision under time pressure. In emergency situations for example, so a surgeon has to take uh, decisions which are emergent in nature. You know in a given situation for example, when a when an incision has been made and the surgery is in progress, then a situation may arise and therefore, situation awareness becomes important. 
So, the medical professional has to be very strong on situation awareness. And then depending upon that, the course of the procedure may require some modification, change or uh, something may have to be done. So, decision under time pressure will also be there. Most uh, say in a driving situation, for example, when some pedestrian comes in front of the car that we are driving, then we have to take a take an emergency uh, decision where it is time pressure. <coughs> so, time is very little, time available is very little between the situation arising and the action to be implemented. Then familiarity and expertise in decision making, they play a very important role. Expert decision making is aut generally automatic, intuitive, effortless decision making. We have talked about skills for example and we talked about skilled behavior in experts. And some uh, researchers make a distinction between system 1 and system 2. So, system 1 is more holistic and where you know experts take decision based on system 1. And this is also called naturalistic approach which involves high skills and expertise. Whereas, decision making in novices is deliberate decision making. We talked about rule based decisions or knowledge based decisions for example and it will be time taking and system 2 is involved which is more analytic in nature and heuristic approach can be adopted which involves decision biases. So, heuristic has this uh, small issue associated with it that most of the heuristic decisions which are uh, can be considered as non-rational at times, they are shortcuts and quick solutions to problems or quick decisions, they can have some decision biases. Then fatigue plays an important role in decision making. What is fatigue? Fatigue is a state of tiredness or diminished functioning. So, there may be a sensory fatigue for example, at times we feel that our, we are not able to register the information that is available from the external world. The sensitivity uh, declines. Fatigue is typically a normal transient response to exertion. It is not some kind of thing which is permanent. Uh, stress, boredom or inadequate sleep, but also may be unusually prolonged and indicative of disorder. If uh, fatigue prolongs, then it indicates some disorder. For example, chronic fatigue syndrome, anemia, hyperthyroidism. So, uh, one has to be you know, responsive to a fatigue situation. If there is a fatigue, there will be wrong decision making and rest is required. So, by taking some rest, this fatigue can be taken care of. Fatigue involves a reduced response of a receptor cell or sense organ resulting from excessive stimulation in the sensory domain for example. So, if the information is not accurately registered, then further processes will be adversely influenced. Now, this is an interesting finding uh, where you know decision fatigue. So, here we talked about fatigue in general, which may be uh, for whatever we are doing which requires effort, allocation of resources, say attentional resources or working memory resources that will lead to fatigue. In decision fatigue, if wrong decisions are taken, for example, if an individual is involved in decision making for a long time, then there can be decision fatigue. And because of which our the accuracy in our decision making can decline. So, this is an uh, important study by Desiger et al which was done on judicial decisions for example. And uh, so, ordinal position indicates the ordinal position of the particular case that was on which the decision was taken by the judiciary. And then proportion of favorable decisions is on the vertical axis. Now, these dotted lines indicate a lunch break or a rest period. So, uh, this uh, observation or this these data are based on observations from three sessions of decision making. So, in the first session as uh, one can see as the ordinal position is going away further higher, then the decision making or favorable decisions decline. And this is interesting you know that means for the same crime what has been found is that individuals will get different punishments or different decisions depending upon the order in which they are presented before the judiciary. So, this is you know quite an interesting 
finding and observation and uh, to take care of the declining nature uh, 95 per, only 95 percent of the data uh, from each session is considered so that some pattern can be observed. And this holds almost in any area. So there will be a decision fatigue in judicial decision, but in all areas there will be a, a decision fatigue. So people shouldn't work for long on a decision making process. For example, the, in the air traffic control tower, uh, generally operators are not expected to work for longer duration. Signal detection tasks, vigilance tasks, you know, because heavy engagement of working memory and attention uh, is required. Therefore, uh, there can be decision fatigue very fast and therefore the duration of working for these personnel uh, should not be very large. Then framing. Uh, the effect of framing on decision choice is important. Uh, for example, uh, which option will you choose? Option A, you have a 50 percent chance to win rupees 10,000 and a 50 percent chance to win nothing. Option B, receiving rupees 5,000 for sure. Now framing means that if the same message is framed in different ways, it will be received in different ways and therefore the action or the decision taken on that will be different. That is the whole idea. So if you have made up your mind which option you will choose, let us see, uh, you know. So message framing is framing refers to how a message is communicated, the same message presented in different ways is also received differently. And, uh, preferences can change because of the message framing. So we consider this question, which option will you choose? And most people choose option B. So most people choose rupees 5,000 as a surety. However, the expected value is the same in the two alternatives. So for option A, the expected value is 0 0.5, that is the probability, 50 percent chance is the probability of 10,000 and 50 percent chance to win nothing. So 0 0.5 into 10,000 plus 0 0.5 into 0 is 5,000. And of course, the expected value in B is just 100 percent. So 1 into 5,000, 5. So expected value is the same. So here, what is suggested is that the choice is based on risk aversion. People adopt a choice by which they can averse risk. They do not want to admit risk. Now let us take a different example. You have a 50 percent chance to lose. Now in the earlier one we had win. Now we have lose and uh, lose and then uh, rupees 10,000 and a 50 percent chance at nothing. Now losing rupees 5,000 for sure option D. C. So option C and option D are now given and now here it is interesting. Here most people choose option C although again you know, the expected values are equal. So in a losing situation, the choice is based on risk seeking. So if it is a losing situation, individuals will seek risk. But if it is a uh, winning, winning situation, then they want to avoid risk because definitely something will be won. Now why does it happen and how can this be explained? Daniel Bernoulli's concept of diminishing sensitivity provides an explanation for both risk aversion and risk seeking. And what this principle suggests or concept suggests, not the expected value, but the expected utility determines the choice. So what is the utility? You know, will I get this, some level of satisfaction out of this? So now utility for rupees 5,000 is greater than 0.5 times the utility of rupees 10,000, okay? And therefore, there is risk aversion. 0.5 times the utility of minus rupees 5, is a loss, is greater than the utility of minus rupees 5,000. I lose only 5,000, but there, there is a probability that I lose 10,000. So this is risk seeking. So let us better seek the risk. And here, the assumption is that utility of zero amount will be zero. So if there is nothing, there is no utility. So this diminishing sensitivity explains why 
there will be risk aversion or risk seeking. And this S-shaped relationship between value and utility again indicates the asymmetry between the loss and gain and how the utility or loss is perceived. And uh, so risk seeking is a convex function and risk aversion is a concave function. And therefore, one can see that these differences are coming out because of that. So problem framing is very important and this can influence how the decisions are made. Then effort also influences performance. Effort, performance and heuristic in decision making they are related. So here for example, the level of decision performance increases as the resources allocated or the effort involved or invested is increased. And here we find that heuristic provides better results as compared to the full algorithm where a compensatory model is adopted and then the increasing utility is shown in this particular direction. And therefore, we would like to use heuristic, for example, in certain decision-making processes where, so heuristic reduces effort. So basically, by which we mean that at lesser effort, heuristic provides a higher performance. That is what this solid curve indicates as compared to the full algorithm as indicated by the dotted line. Then there are different approaches to decision making. There is the normative approach, the descriptive approach, and the prescriptive approach. And basically, uh, these approaches depend upon whether we take a psychological approach, information processing approach, or we want to prescribe uh, how a decision should be taken. The normative approach to decision making, how individuals should make decisions, that is the normative. You know. So once we, we say these are the norms, this is the normative method of taking a decision, and this is how people should take decisions. Uh, there is a rational choice theory. So assumption is because uh, rationality assumes that all individuals will act or behave in a similar manner, and all individuals will have the information that is required or necessary for a particular decision and assumes a rational decision maker. So there is a rational choice theory. The assumption is that the decision making is rational and is based on a priori consideration than on empirical observations. So it is not based on any empirical observation. And then so the, because choice theory would say that, OK, these are the alternatives, all alternatives are known, all probabilities are known. And therefore, if the decision maker is rational, then all decision makers will come out with this decision. So we can fix the decision, but uh, we have already seen what kind of limitations that can have. Then in the descriptive approach, it is based on empirical observations and empirical studies. It is concerned with the psychological factors that guide behavior. So rather than the rationality, what are the psychological factors that are involved? We have considered the information processing model, for example, and they suggest the cognitive or information processing mod components that are involved in descriptive decision making. Studies, so in the descriptive approach, studies effect of biases and heuristics as a result of limitations on attention, working memory, and choice of a strategy. So one is that all, all alternatives are not known. Even if all alternatives are known, as assumed in the rational approach, then we have selective attention. We may not be able to play attention to all. Our working memory has a limitation, 7 plus minus 2 chunks or items uh, in the memory can be retained, and then choice of a strategy. So working memory limitations, attentional limitations, they, these are the psychological processes will add to the rationality assumption. And therefore, uh, it is important to learn how people really make decisions. And empirical observations provide a good basis for that. Then the prescriptive approach focuses on methods of improving decision making to be more in line with the normative decision data. So if certain norms have been stated, then prescriptive. What prescription is there? So it's just like the medical professional's prescription, take this, do this, and so on. It approaches to improve decision making. And mm. it may be the training on targeted practice. Targeted practice means what are the kinds of issues that come up in decision making. And one is 
biases. You know, individuals are involved in some kind of biases in taking decision. Uh, for example, uh, there may be uh, some bias judgment, for example, judgment biases may be there and uh, so on. And then proceduralization, established procedures, how to carry out decisions. And all individuals in the organization on the system should use those procedures. Then displays can be made to indicate what steps are to be taken when. And automation and decision support tools can be used. So when we go to the session on automation and its relationship with performance, we'll come back to this. So today, uh, we have talked about decision making as a process of choosing an appropriate action from among a set of alternatives. right? And these alternatives, uh, there may be uncertainty, etc. And these alternatives may occur with different probabilities. Uh, the choice of the action based on these alternatives can have different consequences. And they provide feedback, which may be delayed, which may be uncertain, incomplete. So all that can influence decision making. So it's a very complex situation. Most often, decisions are required to be made under uncertainty, most often. Because if it is a certain situation, then over a period of time, there will be set guidelines, set procedures, and so on. But it doesn't happen. New situations arise, and new situation awareness may be there. Technologies change. Therefore, what happens out in the outside world, that also changes. So you can take up the example of the uh, information technology, for example, how it has changed from very simple just desktop com computer to desktop computer to internet of things, et cetera, et cetera, and how you know, decision making would be changed depending on that. Then several psychological factors influence decision making. We have looked at these psychological factors as well. These are some questions for discussion. And certain things should be learned after the session is over. And we have not covered several things in this session because of the time paucity. But uh, let's take these questions. And uh, you can learn on your own. The, these questions indicate how you should go about that. So question number one, humans generally use heuristics. For example, satisficing was one example, as quick and shortcut approaches to decision making. Invariably, read it as invariably, heuristics lead to certain biases. Some biases that humans use in decision making are zero risk bias. Let's not take risk, zero risk. Confirmation bias. Confirmation bias means if I have formulated a hypothesis, I want to confirm it. And therefore, I want to see that the observations or situation is like that. And availability bias. You know, with whatever I did uh, in the earlier instance, that may be still available in the memory. And therefore, that is the availability bias, so availability of an alternative, of a choice, of a decision. That can, uh, again, that can be bias. So do a literature survey to identify heuristics and cognitive biases. So heuristics and cognitive biases are associated. Generally, as I said, heuristics will lead to some cognitive biases. And describe how they apply to decision making. How to use these in the decision making process. Question two, this lecture discussed two rules of decision making. The weight added and elimination by aspects. There are several other rules you know, we have not talked about. Because the idea was just to indicate what are the possible ways in which this is. Most often, some expected value is computed. Some Thing may be eliminated. Here we have considered, for example, elimination by aspect. But they can be elimination by alternative. So instead of elimination by aspect, we can use elimination by brand, for example. And then will that change the decision? And how do we go about eliminating the brand? So, And there are some other rules, like lexicographic and so on. Now, these can explain how different choices are possible under different rules. So if rule x is applied, choice will be this. y is applied, choice will be this. And uh, as we saw earlier, it is not that we say that individual will use that approach or that decision heuristic. But based on the final decision, one calculates backward and finds out which particular rule, on which particular rule is this based. 
So, in many situations that can be used as a basis. So, and explore the relevant studies to summarize these rules. So, what are these rules? Summarize these rules and maybe give some example to use these rules. Question 3 is design and conduct a study to investigate the effect of problem framing described in the following slides. Employ two groups, so exact procedure is described here, group 1 for situation 1 and group 2 for situation 2. What results do you expect? So, first you write down the results, then only do the experiment. Do the results of the study meet your expectations? Conduct a review of Kahneman and Tversky's prospects theory to explain your finding. We have not gone into further detail of the prospects theory, but you can look at this theory and analyze your results. So, problem 1 is, uh, this is based on Kahneman and Tversky's actual problem that they use. Imagine that the Indian government is preparing for the outbreak of an epidemic, which is expected to kill 600 people. For example, it happened uh, with the COVID-19 recently. Two alternative programs to combat the disease have been proposed. Assume that the exact scientific estimates of the consequences of the two programs 1 and 2 are as follows. If program 1 is adopted, 200 people will be saved, whereas adoption of program 2 has one third probability that 600 people will be saved and two thirds probability that no people will be saved. Which program should be adopted? So, this is a decision process involved. Situation 2, imagine that the Indian government is preparing for the outbreak of an epidemic which is expected to kill 600 people. Two alternative programs to combat the disease have been proposed. Assume that the exact scientific estimates of the consequences of the two programs 1 and 2 are as follows. If program 1 is adopted, 400 people will die, whereas adoption of program 2 has one third probability that no people will die and two thirds probability that 600 people will die. Which program should you adopt? Again, if you see the expected values and all that, then uh, they may be the same. So, how do you go about taking the decision? And you find interesting observations. You should uh, use groups of about 20 people, uh, two different groups, and each group should be given different situations. So, these are some of the references we should go through, particularly Kahneman and Tversky's uh, references. Uh, they will provide you further detail on the prospects theory and uh, this uh, reading uh, the Denziger and Levav and Ebnaim Peso article will be very interesting. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.